Well, thank you, and to my father, uh, Cliff. <laughs> Mr. President, Dr. Wilson, students and guests. Uh, where's Joe Rice? Hey, hey, Joe. Joe Rice, a uh, Cleveland plane dealer. Uh, Senator Quayle asked me to send his regards to your paper. <laughs> I didn't know that uh, Joe was coming over, so I made a few rather candid notes about the political situation that I thought I would use. But since Joe, since you're here, this is going to be a hell of a dull speech. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> the uh, it's a great honor to me to come here and meet with the scholars and be in that beautiful center there today and with Cliff. Uh, a great honored political warrior of of campaigns uh, of, of the past and of the present i come i guess i have to establish my politi political credentials a little bit to, to uh, speak to you even though i uh, have been introduced as a previous national democratic committee chairman the fact is that we democrats have a bad habit of replacing the Democratic Committee chairman every time we lose an election. So that means that Democratic, former Democratic Committee chairmen are a dime a dozen. <laughs> in fact, in every presidential campaign of recent history, one of the problems uh, that the candidate has is we've got so many former Democratic Committee chairmen around Washington, what do we do with all of them? What can we do to keep them busy? Because if they're not busy, they sit around with their friends like Joe Rice and brief them and backbite the campaign. So uh, that, that, I know, was one of Walter Mondale's problems and apparently is becoming one of Governor Dukakis' problems. And after this speech, I'm sure they'll find something for me to do today. <laughs> but I come from Texas politics. I uh, was a colleague of Lyndon Baines Johnson. Now, you've heard all these terrible stories about landslide Lyndon and the fact that he did get elected in a very close Senate race with some question about the origin of the votes that he got from several counties in South Texas, namely Duval County. Well, I want to defend my friend Lyndon Johnson here today for just a minute, even though that was history. His memory lingers on because Lyndon Johnson doesn't get proper credit for being the father of the civil rights programs for America. A lot of people try to give it to Hubert Humphrey, and he did work hard and deserves a lot of credit. But not like Lyndon, because Lyndon really believed way back there in 1948, when we had those elections, Cliff, that just because you died, that didn't mean you didn't have a right to vote. <laughs> and, and in fact, just two years later, when I ran for my first state office, in Duval County, several other counties down there. I received in that little rural county, I don't know, there are probably 1,200 people there. I got 5,286 votes, <laughs> and my opponent only got two. I asked the party boss, George Parr, what happened? How come I didn't get them all? And he says, well, I just slipped up a little bit. I can't be perfect here and there. Now, that's my background in politics, so you will understand that I have some different views than some of my Democratic colleagues about the new party politics from time to time. Even though I served on the Charter Commission in 1974, and as I told Dr. Wilson a while ago, I was the author of proportional representation, which is the key I might say, of reform legislation. 
I reformed myself in 1974, and in 1988, I'm ready to re-reform my reform self, because this politics is a very simple game. And we've made it so complicated that we think that only a very few people can practice it, and that we have changed the way we do politics to the point that very people under a few understand it. But it's really very simple. Politics is really nothing but reacting to the desires of the American people. Most American people are unselfish. The presidential vote is a different vote than any vote that you cast normally. You cast votes for governor, you cast votes for senators, congressmen, generally based on a specific situation that you're interested in. Maybe a given issue, maybe a state issue or a federal issue. I think the presidential vote is different than that. I think a presidential vote is a truly unselfish, patriotic vote for most people. I'm not so, you know, we're, our society is all different and we don't, none of us do it all alike. But I really believe that it's, the, it's a basically vote where it's guided by two things, opportunity and security, personally and for our nation. They're both the same. Security for me and my family, and opportunity for me and my family, that's the individual basis, and that drives a presidential voter. I believe the same thing drives a presidential voter about his nation or her nation. Security for the nation and opportunity for the nation and world leadership positions. It's just that simple. I also think that winning campaigns are no different than your family. How do you look at your family? What are your responsibilities to your family? I think most of us feel about the same, that our basic responsibility as an adult is to our spouse and to our immediate children and then to our extended family, nieces, nephews, uncles, brothers, so on and so forth then to friends, and then to new friends. And political campaigns that forget their base do so at their peril. And lots of mistakes have been made in the past political campaigns because the candidate forgets that you have to, have to campaign with your base as well as you have to campaign for that new and undecided voter. I know. Uh, one of the problems of our nomination process now was the common language, why don't the dissidents and the parties shut up? Don't they know we won? The campaign's over. We won. In politics, it's never over. It's not even over when it's over, because the winner continually has to campaign with their own constituency and to build that constituency. In a presidential campaign, I know Cliff White knows this because he has been there, you're sworn in as President of the United States and you immediately start campaigning with your own constituency for your program and to reach out to, to a new constituency. So it's never over and you can never take anything for granted. Now those are just generalisms about politics that I think hold true in every campaign. But I think they're particularly true in 1988 as we go into this campaign. Now, the scholars and I met this morning, and Cliff and I both, I think, agree. This is, this is not the dirtiest campaign on, in history. I have read that, and I'm sure you have. I hear it on television about how dirty this campaign is. This is not a dirty campaign. It's a trivial campaign. We used to have dirty campaigns in the old days of politics, this, that, and other. This campaign has been trivialized to the point of where we have, to, where the candidates are having to campaign, and I say George Bush has been doing this quite well, really by symbols. We've always campaigned by symbols. We always have lived by symbols, but we've never had to, to package it and concentrate it like this particular campaign has because we're driven by television. We're glued to television. 
eighty five percent of the americans get their information now from television so you've got about two minutes in the evening if you can happen to catch a news show on the political candidate tries to package his message with a picture a symbol and a bike that's all it is i deplore that i read where other people deplore it but truth matter is if you're a candidate you got to work with what you got and that's that's what's happening and it's going to continue to happen and it'll be more so in 1992 than it is in 1988 until somebody comes along and says i'm going to run me a campaign and i'm not going to hire slick two-tone shoes you can see i'm a 1950s candidate two-tone shoes guys to advise me about polling to advise me how to look and tell me what to say i'm just going to go out here and run as me and when that guy wins everybody's going to start doing it that way but till then they're going to keep on doing it like it's been successful in the past few years and that's the total commercial packaging of a candidate to the point that you don't know what that candidate really believes himself because you don't ever really get to look at the candidate what you're looking at is what the advisors believe according to the polls about what you want to see now i'm one of those that thinks that a political candidate that has to read a poll to decide what he wants to say and what the american people need to hear oughtn't to be in politics to start with but that's not the way it is i'm reminiscing about a, a time that was past but it will return again i, I really think one of these days some guy's going to come in and just say i'm so and so you're going to have to take me hide and hair and all and he's going to win and then everybody will start doing that you remember when when uh, some senator walked across the state. Hell, everybody started walking across the state. That's the silliest thing I ever saw. But they started doing it until they, until they got beat, and then that, uh, then that changed it. But uh, a lot of this is because the parties are weak. Television drives it. I'm a former party chairman. I told Cliff coming across the, walking across here a while ago, it's not true of the Republican Party necessarily, but the Democratic Party. I believe I probably contributed more money this year in politics than the National Democratic Committee will, will contribute to campaigns, except maybe the presidential campaign. And that's a shame. Everything we have done in the reform movement in the last 20 years has weakened the party system. Every law that we have passed has weakened the party system. For our system of government to work, we have to have a strong two-party system. It's the way we have accountability. It's the way we have responsibility. And without it, you're going to continue to have a lack of participation and low voter turnouts. We've got to find ways to get people more interested and in working and having a part in the process. The way you do that is through the party are working actually in the political campaign. These campaigns this year, you're only a backdrop. You're not part of it. You're part of a photo opportunity. And some cases, not even that. In one case of a vice presidential candidate, the whole swing was not to talk to voters, but to go to television stations and hold press conferences and then talk through the, through the uh, television and maybe indirectly through the newspaper and I think we ought to take politics back to the American people. But you gotta wanna you gotta wanna receive us. And that's the reason I'm encouraged about what you're doing here and you come to these things and you're part of the process and you're working at it. Those I got a lot more out of talking to those students than they got from me, believe me, and encourage that. Now, since Joe is here, I really got to talk a little bit about the campaign itself, but uh and then we'll get into some questions. There's no question. But what? Well, let me let me let me ask you a question first. How many of you have as your first choice the nominees that you first wanted that were running 
and none. In other words, how many of you were for Dukakis and George Bush from the beginning to be the nominees running for president this year? Raise your hand. How many of you? How many of you preferred someone else other than? Okay. That's what I thought. And that's another reason that I think that the presidential campaign is swinging back and forth from the polls. Yesterday, and I haven't had a chance to read the papers or see it, but yesterday I understand Associated Press Media General released its poll that showed George Bush, I believe, 56-39 in the lead. This morning, the Washington Post ABC poll released 40, uh, 46 for Bush, 50 for the caucus. Tomorrow, the Los Angeles Times poll will read exactly the same. 50 Bush, 46 to caucus. This thing has been swinging back and forth because obviously there is a large body of voters. Some say 40%, at least 30%, who have no strong choice and that they really are undecided and that, they will, that are moving back and forth. Plus, that two-thirds probably that do have a choice, it really was a second choice of, their, of the person that they really wanted, so they're not, the, even the leaners are not leaning very strong. So we're going to see a race moving back and forth. Whoever dominates the news for a couple of nights is going to move into the lead. Both these candidates have made enough serious mistakes to be absolutely eliminated if they had a if they had a strong opponent. There's no question about it. They'd be out of the race if they had strong opposition from the other, other side. Uh, that's, that's the way the race is developing. George Will, I think, uh, probably said it as well as anybody in one of the periodicals that uh, this race is going to go along about like a, a professional basketball game, and whoever gets hot in the last two minutes is going to win because I do think it's going to swing back and forth. I don't, the caucus has made enough mistakes that, uh, that he really ought to be 15 or 20 points behind. But I have to say, George Bush has made enough mistakes that he oughtn't even be in the race. <laughs> and he's leading. So with that kind of a climate, you're going to see a race that's going to go right into, into October Holes moving back and forth, and whoever catches on that last two weeks will decide, decide this race all the way through. The advantages, of course, are obvious. Currently, the polls, the advantages to George Bush at this moment, his big advantage is that he has been able to very clearly make the symbol of the Pledge of Allegiance. Now, I knew Cliff, if you had anything to do with it, we're going to do the Pledge of Allegiance as soon as I got here today. But, uh, and that's good. I happen to think that's a wonderful thing. I grew up giving the Pledge of Allegiance. I don't see anything wrong with that. Uh, you might win the law school argument about the Pledge of Allegiance, but you're not going to win it with the American people. And that was a mistake to get for the caucus to get caught into that thing. Plus, the fact in, the, in the threshold that every candidate has to pass, you elect the president, I said this a while ago, for security, for yourself, for your family, for your nation. It's a threshold that every candidate has to, has to pass. A lot of times it's not an issue because both candidates have passed it. It's not a matter of question. We've been arguing about this, the, the defense budget now for two, three, four years, whether we're spending enough money or too much money. That meant in this campaign, every candidate has to pass the threshold, that window of national security. George Bush jumped through the window by embracing every arm system that anybody ever thought of. That's the same thing Jack Kennedy did in 1960, by the way, so that's not all original with that. Jack Kennedy did it, as you remember, Cliff, on the so-called missile gap. There wasn't any gap to start with, but he put Nixon on the defensive and, and kept him on the defensive clear through the campaign. Mike Dukakis has a large number of military experts who say his program is 
a the correct program to assure the safety of the united states of america on national security but he has not been able to sell it and these debates coming up sunday night i believe that he has to confront that issue and convince the american people that they will be secure under his administration or he is in really deep deep trouble in the political campaign uh, i think those are just some of the given issues that you've got to you've got to deal with with the american people and they have to understand you and that's the reason campaigns uh, have to be clearly down to certain symbols because you, you don't have much time. You've got a few minutes on television. A lot of people watch the debate. It's a unique opportunity for the caucus. Now, let me say, too, here that I think presidential campaigns are easier than running for county commissioner, certainly easier than running for mayor because you've got one or two or three at the most big issues that will decide the campaign. When you're running for local office, you may have 25 issues that you've got to deal with. So I don't feel sorry for, for our nominees of our party. I think they've got an easy job because you've got the national security question, you've got the economy situation that you've got to deal with, and then you've got the acceptability as a person. Those are the, if you can pass those three thresholds, you can become president of the United States. Often we make it a lot more complicated than that, but that's all it is, is those three things. The advantage at this time rests with Bush on all three of them, on all three. Now, whether they will be with him next week or not, I don't know, but I am fully convinced that it will swing back and forth, and whoever gets hot in October is going to win this race. I'm not going to get in to say that I've been around too long, Cliff and I have. I'm not partisan enough to say that the election of George Bush would be a disaster for the United States, because it would not be. It really would not be, nor would the caucuses. They will both make good presidents if they're elected, because it's something about the presidency that brings out the very best in whoever holds that office. I told the students a little story about Lyndon Johnson, and honestly, I don't live my life with Lyndon, memories of Lyndon Johnson. But, I, but something occurred at the LBJ school that impressed me a lot just before Lyndon died. And he had a center such as this, the LBJ school at the University of Texas, where he had guest speakers and like we're doing here today. And Lyndon would often come down from his office in the library to hear the speech of the day. Uh, whoever happened to be there. And this particular time, I was there, and we had a very partisan speaker, and he was tearing into Richard Nixon, uh, you know, this hip and thigh, and made an extremely partisan speech and referred to Nixon in, in, the, in, the, in the most unfavorable terms. Uh, that, And he had a lot of unfavorable terms, as you say, said about it. A lot dirtier than today. Well, you know, this, this campaign today is, is not dirty. But uh, after the... The speaker finished speaking, and he was a friend of the president's, or ex-president. Lyndon Johnson took the podium. And on behalf of Richard Nixon, he says, I have lots of differences with Richard Nixon, but all presidents want to be good presidents. All presidents make mistakes. And all presidents, if they had it to do over again, may try to do it a little bit different. But every president, on every decision, does the very best he can with the information he has while he's making that decision. No president wants to make a bad decision or something will hurt this country. And Richard Nixon is one of the, was one of those. So I have, I have lost a lot of my partisan edge about the person of the presidency because I think they, they've all done, I, I, I can't think of a challenger that wouldn't have made a pretty good president. So we'll be all right as a nation with either one of these men. It's interesting. It's a lot of fun. They'll move to the center. Whoever gets elected is going to disappoint a lot of their followers because they're going to think, gee, I voted for him to do this, and he got in there, and damn if he didn't do the opposite. Uh, Ronald Reagan gets a little of that every now and then. Every president gets it. But the important thing is like getting to play in the World Series. This is the World Series of politics and self-government and participation. 
it's a lot of fun to win it's important to win but it's more important to play so all of us do the pledge of allegiance all to include our vote and our work in fact I, I wish Governor Dukakis had taken a challenge to the Pledge of Allegiance and used Jesse Jackson's advice. And sure, the Pledge of Allegiance is important, but so is the pledge that we will have good care for our older citizens, that we'll take care of the young, that we'll be fair, and that we'll vote. I pledge that too, because that's as big a pledge to this country as anything else we can do.